Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. I've got here Champions of Midgard by Grey Fox Games, designed by Oli Steines. This is a a worker placement game for two to four players that plays in roughly 60 to 90 minutes. In this video, I'm going to explain how to play with just the base set and base components. The term Midgard comes from ancient North mythology and means one of the nine worlds. Also in Germanic mythology, it refers to Earth. In this game, Midgard is a small coastal town being beset by all manner of crazy beasts and monsters. And we're going to take on the role of Vikings. Um, and we've got two different kinds of Vikings. We've got useful warrior Vikings who are going to fight monsters by rolling dice and hoping to do damage. We've also got cowardly, yeah, cowardly, essential support Vikings who are going to go out into the town of Midgard and take actions for us to help supply our soldiers and send them off to distant lands in search of glory. Because glory, which is marked by this track around the outside of Midgard, is how we win the game. At the end of the game, whoever has been the most glorious is, of course, the winner. <clears throat> I've got out here in front of me all of the components from the base set of Champions of Midgard. We've got different colors, meeples for different players. We've got soldiers that you'll keep. We've got different Viking leaders. You'll take on the role of one of these leaders and have a special ability. They've also got an inventory where you keep your army. Tons of long ships. You will use these to sail to distant lands and fight enemies. Military and economic buildings. We'll deploy some of these randomly on the board at the beginning of the game to ensure replayability. The three resources of Midgard. Gold. Food and wood. Favor tokens, which you get by defeating enemies and stuff. These allow you to uh, re-roll dice if you're getting, if you have a bad time in combat. Um, you can roll any number of dice with these. Um, they also uh, are worth two victory points at the end of the game. Three kinds of monsters. Trolls, Durger, and monsters. The trolls are besetting uh, the town and must be killed every round or everybody takes blame. And monsters are in distant lands, and you fight them for even more glory, but first you have to get there. In your longship. Blame tokens. These come up when you don't kill the troll, and they're worth negative victory points at the end of the game. If you do kill the troll, though, you can give yours to the other players, and they'll take a penalty. Four tiny decks of cards. These are rune cards. They have glory points on them and special abilities. When you buy the card, you get the special ability, and then later on, you get the glory points. They look like this. These are sage cards. They have victory conditions on them. At the end of the game, you'll get uh, this. If you achieve this goal, then you'll get it. You'll get five glory. Or if you tie with someone else, you'll get two glory. Also note that uh, these are secret and kept secret. And you can buy more during the game. These are merchant ships. They'll come to Midgard and trade you valuable things. Finally, these are encounter cards. You'll encounter these when you're sailing to distant lands to fight epic monsters. Some of them are pretty bad. You've also got a first player token, three wound tokens, and a turn tracker. So now that we've been through the stuff that comes in the basic set, let's set up the game for three players. There are two public longships that can be used by anyone, and they start on the board like this. Anyone can take these public longships and set sail. The remaining longships, which you can tell the difference, have a cost on them. And this cost is um, shown here, and that means that you can buy it during the course of the game. It's also worth glory if you buy your own longship, because having your own longship is way cooler than using the public longship that everyone rides around in. Um, it's also got a number of players depicted at the top here. This will only come up in a three-player game. Because I'm setting up a three-player game, this four-player longship is going to go back in the box. So I'm now set up to play a three-player game of Champions of Midgard. I've got the trolls up here, I've got the draugr here, the monsters down here in the uh, distant lands. I've got um, my three buildings set up. Now, in a three-player game, I use one military building and two economic buildings. You can see here, I've got the two different decks that I've randomized. However, in a uh, two-player game, you would only use one military and one economic, and in a four-player game, you would have a third economic building. 
I've got my boats here. I've taken the skied out because that's got the three player symbol on it. But the uh, four player boat that's uh, the extra boat that's used has gone back in the box. I've got eight merchant ship cards. That's one for each round of the game. And I've got uh, two um, of the rune cards set up here. The destiny deck here. None of those are revealed. We've also um, determined that the starting player will be green player. Now, uh, however, you do, the rules instruct you to give this to the person who last had the most glory in battle. So maybe that's the winner of your last game of Champions of Midgard. Or maybe it's your friend who's an actual Viking and murders people for glory. But uh, the rules also state that once someone's got the starting player token, then the player to their immediate right, in this case red player because we go around the table, uh, gets to choose the leader of their choice. Then blue player will choose the leader. And finally green will get to choose from the remaining two leaders. The fourth leader will go back in the box. Each player has put one of their meeples in the worker's hut here. That's because you don't start with all your meeples. One of them you have to recruit later for gold. Gold cost is here. Now, in a uh, two-player game, you would get four meeples each. But because this is a three-player game, one of these meeples is going back in the box. In a four-player game, everybody gets three meeples as well. So, we've also got two discs. We use one disc to put on our leaderboard here to denote that it is blue players or red players or whoever. And we've got the other disc up here on the top of the scoreboard here to take keep track of our glory. Our round token is down there on the round track. So all of our players are set up ready to go. We've put one of our meeples back in the box because we're not playing with two players. We've also got our starting resources here, which means one swordsman who's going to go in our inventory. We've got one favor, one gold, one food, and one wood, and one food. And we've also got our destiny with our secret objective on the back. Don't show that to anyone. And um, with that, we're all ready to go. So the game takes place in three phases. Setup, gameplay, and cleanup. At least that's how they describe it. Setup has us dealing out new cards and um, to any of the... Uh, Piles that are exhausted. In this case, because we've just set up, there are no cards on the board yet, so we would do that in the setup phase. The gameplay phase kind of takes place in sort of three mini steps. The first step is the worker placement step, where our players will be taking their workers and putting them onto uh, locations like this on the board in order to claim actions. Players will take turn alternating the placement of workers on the board, just like uh, if you're familiar with worker placement games, that's how it works. If you're not familiar, essentially we each get to take three actions per turn with these three guys we've got. We'll select one of the actions on the board by putting on the, them on these colored disc spaces. I'll go through more about what the colored disc me spaces mean when I get to the explanation of uh, this phase in detail. Following uh, this phase, we'll look at all of the meeples that have taken aggressive actions. That's anyone who's gone on a space next to a red banner. Um, and you'll, it'll be pretty obvious. This says fight the troll. This says fight the draugr. Um, down here, it's uh, anyone who's taken a longship and gone to fight one of these monsters across the sea. So uh, we will then assign our soldier dice to the fight actions that we've taken. And the final step of the uh, gameplay phase is to resolve the combat in which we'll roll dice and people will die and monsters will die and it will be glorious. And we'll get glory and money and resources and then we'll go back to Midgard and drink and be merry. And um, after the resolve combat step, we'll go into cleanup where we collect all of our workers back from the board. We discard any uh, undefeated things and get rid of sort of any uh, stuff like that. And then we, um, we put gold down on some of the uh, monsters down here to sort of incentivize people to come across the sea and kill these big bad men. And then we advance the round track, boop. And with that, we're ready to move into round two and begin with setup again. This repeats for eight rounds. And then we do final scoring and find out who is the most glorious and effective Viking. So everybody's got their resources and their loot and everything. So I'm just gonna uh, begin setup for round one of Champions of Midgard. We also uh, do this. We also turn over a merchant ship card to reveal the next merchant ship available. In this case, trade one gold for three swordsmen. That's the uh, board all set up. We've revealed the monsters. We've got uh, everything ready to go. So you may have noticed during setup there that we've got three different colors of banners on the board. 
These gray banners mean instant. The minute you put a worker meeple down there, like this, you gain whatever bonus is here. In this case, a wood and a food. The blue ones are instant and uh, stackable slots, which means that when someone puts a meeple down here, they can take this die. But if nobody takes the die for the whole round, a second die will be added in the setup step, and the next uh, turn someone can put their meeple down and take both dice. Finally, we have the red banner assault slots. I think I explained this earlier, but picking one of these slots means you'll fight one of these monsters. Now that we've done setup, we'll progress on to the gameplay step, and the first step of that is assign workers. So our heroes will take turns assigning workers to these spaces. I'll just go over quickly the spaces that exist on the board. The hunting grounds is a space that actually, it's, a, it's down as an assault step, but that's probably just because it uses the warrior dice. It actually involves you hunting for food, and uh, up to a maximum of six, and when you take this action, you can uh, roll all, any number of uh, your warrior dice, and you will gain food equal to the number of weapon or hit symbols that you roll. Note that uh, this only involves warrior dice you haven't assigned to a monster this round, so anyone who's fighting monsters can't participate. This is also the only space on the board with four discs, because it can be taken by any number of uh, players. Next, we've got the fight the troll action. Fighting the troll um, will put you into combat with this bad boy here. And um, this is uh, important because the troll is associated with blame. Blame are these tokens here that I spoke about at the beginning that are worth negative points at the end. When you defeat a troll, you can uh, take one of your blame tokens, put it back in the supply, then you take one from the supply and give it to another player. This is important because it means you can give one to another player even if you don't have one yourself. You'll also get one wood. For those that miss out on fighting the troll in Glorious Battle, you can go and fight these Druger. The Druger are basically sort of just like uh, undead mooks that sort of haunt the uh, mountains here. And they are uh, they can be killed. You've got uh, three glory, one gold if you kill this one. Three, well, they're both actually exactly the same. I don't know how I managed to do that. But uh, I've drawn two that are the exact same. It's also worth noting that they come in different colors. And at the end of the game, if you there's three colors. And if you get a full set of three you'll get uh, bonus victory points. But I'll talk about that later when we get to final scoring. Point is, if you put your meeple down here, your Viking soldiers, your Viking dice will go and uh, fight one of these guys. Next, we've got the Runesmith. The Runesmith is this rune deck, and when you come here, you pay a wood, and you can take one of these cards. When you take the card, you can hang on to it for as long as you want, and eventually you'll activate, uh, when you want, you can activate the action on the bottom of the card, and at the end of the game, you'll also gain glory points equal to this symbol in the middle. The next action you can take is the Sage's House. When you come to the Sage's House, you can look at uh, two Destiny cards and choose one to keep and one to get rid of. This will allow you to score extra points at the end with another secret objective. You can also look at one of the Face Down Encounter cards, Journey cards. What is a Face Down Journey card? These are Journey cards. They stop you from getting to the distant lands. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. We'll find out more about them in a minute. We've got two actions here, don't be fooled. We've got the Shipwright. The shipwright action allows you to build a boat. In a three-player game, these are the boats you can build. They go up, uh, they have glory points on them that they'll be worth at the end. They've also got a cost down here and a capacity at the top. The capacity of a boat is the number of soldiers that can travel on it. Well, what does that mean? Let's talk about the next action. So you can see here that all of the boats have an action symbol on them, including the bo boats that you purchase. That means that you can use these with one of your meeples. Well, there we go. I've claimed this public longboat. This uh, coin here means that I have to pay to use it. This one's free. What's the difference? This one's bigger and better. This one's smaller. The difference is the capacity. The capacity, when I'm going to see, I'm going to need soldiers. But those soldiers are going to need food or they'll starve. The capacity is the total number of soldiers and total number of food that the boat can carry. It can't carry any more than that. For example, this little one here can only carry five which is a much smaller, meager, more meager number than the much larger one here, but you gotta pay for that. The biggest private boat is eight, the Drakkar. It's also worth the most points. When you take the longship action, you're gonna to have to send your meeple off to one of these spaces. So when you take the longship action, you're gonna to have to send your meeple out to sea, which means off to fight one of these beasts in a distant land. Now we've got three monsters here. We've got a Hrimthurs, an Ivate, and an Eljotnar. We've also got an empty track here, which is only used for four players. So these guys are pretty fearsome. So when you take the longship actions, you'll select one of these locations that you want to go to. 
but you won't actually go there yet. You'll just choose which uh, area you're going to, and it will resolve the actual encounter and travel as part of the resolve combat step later on. The next place you might go is the Jarl's Longhouse. Now, the Jarl's Longhouse allows you to take the starting player token and get a soldier die. A pretty shit, but uh, starting player token is crucial because this is a worker placement game. And going first in a worker placement game is super valuable. Here we have the Stave Church. The Stave Church lets you trade in gold for favor. The more gold you trade, the more favor tokens you get. So that's pretty cool. I've got the Worker's Hut. This means for a certain amount of gold, you can buy your worker, your final worker. This will give you more actions every turn. That's great. But the first person who buys one has to pay the most. They have to pay five gold. The next player will pay four, three, and two. However, the first player that buys them will get to use them first, even on the turn that you buy them. So even though you have to put a worker down to claim one, it's kind of negligible because then you'll pick one up that you can immediately use. Down here, we've got the smokehouse. Going into this slot allows you to take the food there. We've got the blacksmith. That's the same thing. Grab an axe man. The hafter makes spears. Guess what he does? He gives you spearmen. Finally, the swordsmith. If you take that action, you get a sword man. Look at all those blanks. It's a really disappointing guy. Up at the top here, we've got the market. If you take the market action, you can trade, make an equal resources trade, which means you could trade three food for three wood on a one-to-one -one basis. When you're using the market, it doesn't have to be completely equal. Like you could trade two food and two gold for three wood or three wood and a two wood and a food. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? But you get what I mean? So these buildings are actually randomized at the beginning of the game. There's, uh, for example, the raiders here who let you trade one wood for two spearmen. Note that this is not a stackable one, so this is just what happens when you use it. And the skull here gives you two glory. I'll let you guys sort of uh, discover all the different ones that come in the basic set on your own as you go through the game. So you can take the merchant ship action by putting down your meeple here and taking whatever action's on the card. As the game progresses, this action will be replaced with different actions. So you might find different things available here at the merchant ship. There's a final hidden action for anyone who's doing really, really badly. You can take one of your meeples and it just says put it on the leaderboard. So I guess you can put it anywhere on the leaderboard that you want, but maybe you want to put it on your disc. I don't know. But when you do that, you take what's called the beggar action and any player can do this. When you take the beggar action, you can take one resource of any kind from the supply. So a coin or a food or a wood, then just those three. And if uh, you do take this action, it means you also take a blame token because begging is not glorious. So you can see here all of our characters have played. We've got uh, the blue guy grabbing a bunch of spearmen and heading off to fight El Jotnar. The red players decided to grab the swordsman from the merchant ship and fight the troll. And finally, the green player has decided just to stock up on sort of useful things and take this glory rune, perhaps hoping to do a bigger battle later on. With that, we're ready to progress to the assign Viking phase. In this phase, any player who's put down a meeple on a space with a red banner will look at their dice pool and select how they're going to assign those dice. The green player won't assign any in this phase because he hasn't gone on any red spaces. So the assign Viking warrior step is done simultaneously. There's no order uh, listed in the rulebook that I could see. And uh, in our playthrough, we actually do just sort of do it all at once. But uh, I guess you might want to keep an eye on what your opponent's doing. So the red player is going to go fight the troll. He can just grab his entire army and send his whole army if he wants. He really wants to kill that troll round one. And uh, he doesn't want to lose too many men doing it. I'll explain more on that in the next step, resolving combat. So he assigns all of his men to go and kill that troll. And uh, that's because he just really wants to wipe it out in the first round without losing anybody. And he's less likely to lose people the more he sends. Probably. I'll explain the nuances of that when we get to the next step, resolving combat. The blue player has a slightly uh, different situation going on here. He's got to assign people to the boat. So he's taken the big public longship, uh, which he should have paid for, and uh, he's going to put in two spearmen and two food. We'll find out a bit more about why, that, why he's done that in the resolve combat step. But you might be wondering why he didn't send his swordsman when he has the big boat and plenty of room. Well, that's because of this guy who's going to go fight the El Jotnar. If we take a look at the El Jotnar card here, we can see that he says, No swordsmen. That's right. Any swordsmen that come along here will be instantly killed. You 
this uh, basically is saying don't assign them to this monster. But if you do assign them by accident and they wind up in this fight, you don't even get to roll those dice. The minute that uh, you realize your mistake, all of those monsters are just killed. Removed from the game. It sucks. So basically, don't send your warriors to fight something that they can't fight. So it looks like we're pretty much ready to go straight into the resolving combat step. Combat is resolved in an order of left to right. So we'll start by going the Troll, and then the two Draugrs, Krimthurs, Elvate, and Eljotnar. So let's talk about the Troll card. So here we've got our Troll. Every monster has a uh, the name up here, and then it's got an attack value here, a defensive value here, and rewards along the bottom. All of the monster cards are set up this way. You'll notice that the other monster cards are also different colors. This is because you get points at the end for uh, collecting sets. But uh, the troll is colorless, so he doesn't actually have a set on him. So in order to kill the troll, you'll need to roll at least you'll need to roll three weapon symbols on your dice. So let's go ahead and see what happens when Red rolls his dice. Well, that's just terrible. So he's done two wounds and nothing else. Combat happens simultaneously, which means that the troll will now attack back. The troll doesn't have any dice. The troll just does one damage. If he'd rolled a shield, red player had rolled a shield, then he could have defended that one damage and no dice would die. But he didn't defend the damage, so, so one die will die. Well, one, one die will die, yeah. So uh, we've got these little wound tokens. Here they are. These will represent the two wounds that red has just done to the troll. And then red decides to kill off one of his swordsmen. He goes back to the die. He goes back to the dice pool. Then second round of combat takes place. Okay, well, Red has managed to kill the troll this time by doing two damage, but he hasn't rolled any shields, so another swordsman dies. Red could elect to kill the Axeman at any time. The Axeman doesn't have any shields, but he does have a lot more weapons, so he's a bit of a sort of a berserker type dude. But having killed the troll, the Red player will now inherit the glorious rewards. He gets four glory, which moves him up the glory track. He also gets to put back a blame into the pool and take a blame out of the pool to give to another player. Uh, this is optional. He doesn't have to do this, by the way. He'll also get one wood. You go, Red. When Red is done defeating the troll, he takes the card and puts it here with his player board. This is uh, public information, so he'll just leave it there. Then we skip the two Draugr because nobody came to fight them, and we move straight on down here to the Eljotnar. The first thing that happens when Blue goes to the distant land is he has to deal with this journey card. Fortunately, it's all quiet, which means that without paying a cost, Blue can progress to the fight. Now when Blue gets to the fight, he should look at this ratio here. He should really have considered this earlier. What this means is that over the course of the long journey from Midgard to the distant land, his Vikings will have to eat one food for every two people. Well, that's great, because he's packed two foods, so he's got plenty. He really only needs to use one. But Vikings are a hungover and greedy lot, so they'll eat all of the food you sent with them, regardless of whether or not it is too much. However, if you don't have enough, just uh, kill off Vikings until you've got enough food to feed the remainder. Some slots have different food values on them. This makes them less efficient to get to. So now that he's fed his Vikings, Blue can fight the Eljotnar. He's basically the same as the troll fight, slightly different. Here we've got uh, no swordsman rule again, which means that um, if Blue had sent any swordsmen, he wouldn't uh, get to use them. And you can see here that um, he ha that's why he hasn't done that. So the Eljotner has that anti-swordsman symbol we talked about earlier. Fortunately, Blue only sent spearmen, so he's okay. Now, he's this guy has two hit points and two defense, which means that uh, if Blue wants to uh, win this fight, he's going to have to get pretty lucky with just two dice. But if he does win, he'll get 11 glory and a favor token. Well, that's bad news because not only does he only do one wound, but uh, now both of his spearmen are dead. Blue could uh, spend his favor token from earlier to reroll one or more dice. Any, uh, any amount really when he spends this. So maybe he decides to reroll them both and hope for better results. Well, that's the exact same. Blue, you are terrible. Both men die. The fight is over. The monster comes down here. The wound token is reset. And Blue sails back to Midgard. Not glorious. So now that we've done all of our combat, it's time to go back to the uh, cleanup step. 
The cleanup step just involves uh, the first thing that happens is every player does a mad scramble to grab all their meeples back off the board. We did it. We cleaned up the meeples. The next step is to discard any monsters that weren't defeated. Note that this doesn't actually apply to monsters. And rather, discard anything along the top row here that wasn't defeated. So these Draugr go in the discard pile down here. We uh, then uh, go to uh, add gold to these undefeated monsters down here. And that's just to make them more tempting targets for um, our Vikings to come and kill next round. Note that the money we stack up down here to entice our Vikings to these kills is stackable. So if nobody kills any of these guys next turn, they'll just continue to pile on the riches until someone actually manages to do it. We've also got to advance our round token. And with that, we're ready to go back to setup in which we will repopulate these card pools that are missing cards. And uh, we will uh, put out more stackable goods here. And we'll just begin the whole thing all over again. And this will repeat for eight rounds until the most glorious Viking can be determined. So let's talk about final scoring. So in final scoring, our Vikings are probably somewhere over here-ish, maybe slightly lower down or slightly higher up, depending on how the game has gone for them. And we start scoring with the player lowest on the glory track or the leaderboard. In this case, it's blue. So the first thing that blue is going to do is reveal his destiny card have the most runes at the end of the game. So blue will get four glory for this. If he's tied with someone else, he'll get two glory instead. They don't score any points for this. Only blue can score for this. So I've loaded up blue with some cool stuff here that he can use to uh, win the game, but uh, he's got the most runes clearly, so he's gonna go up to uh, 77. Good job, blue. That's four points for having the most runes. We also count up sets of enemies. Now, hopefully you'll have defeated more than three enemies in your game, but uh, enemies are color-coded in three colors, red, yellow, and blue. They've also got symbols on the bottom here if you've got the second edition of the game for colorblind people. So blue is a triangle, yellow is a diamond um, prism, and red is a circle. And for every set you've got, you get five more glory. So in this case, our guy is gonna go up to 82. After we've done um, the destiny cards and the set cards, we'll then look at rune cards. So here we will just only be looking at the uh, glory on the rune cards. So over the course of the game here, our blue players used these three rune cards, so he'll gain six glory for that. Putting him on 88. After the uh, rune cards, we will look at private boats. Did you buy a private boat? Yep, our blue player brought, uh, brought a snack here. And that gets him four. Next up, favor tokens. So favor tokens are worth two points at the end of the game. So here we go, Boop, up to 99, uh, 97. Finally, money. Each Every three coins you have at the end of the game is worth one victory point. Our blue player here has six, so he gets two more. After we score money, we count the blame tokens. One blame token is fairly minor. That's only negative one victory point. However, blame tokens go up exponentially. So two is negative three, and uh, three is uh, negative six, and four is negative 10, all the way up to six or more, which is negative 21. So our blue player, if he'd had two blame, would now go back down three victory points from uh, 99 to 96. So then you'd go through the same process, you go through the uh, destiny, and then monster sets, then runes, then private ships, favors, coins, and blame for the green and the red player. And after you'd resolved that, the whole thing would be resolved. And whoever has the most glory is the most glorious Viking and the winner. And they've won Champions of Midgard and kept Midgard safe from all these terrible monsters. So I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to play Champions of Midgard with uh, Ben and Michael. And we're going to find out which of us is the most glorious Viking um, board gamer guy. So I am. it's worth noting that tomorrow we're going to be using the Dark Mountains and Valhalla expansions. And I'll be putting out another video today with the rule sets for those. So if you uh, want to learn about how to play the expansions or see if there's something you're interested in, please check that out. And... Um, I hope you'll come back and join us for our Viking adventure tomorrow. Thanks for watching, everyone.